Okay. All right, everybody, and welcome to our second session or the afternoon session, at least for us here uh, in Europe, of uh, our first Language Learning Today conference. My name is Kirsten Winkler. I am co-organizing this uh, virtual conference via Google Hangouts with uh, Shiv, Shiv Rajendran. He is the co-founder of uh, Language Lab. And uh, yeah, we are very happy to welcome you to our second uh, live stream. And um, yeah, I'm particularly happy to have such a diverse uh, audience of uh, entrepreneurs in the English language learning space um, with me in this Hangout. Uh, from left to right, just a quick introduction. We have Benjamin Levy. He is um, the co-founder of uh, Gimglish, uh, based in Paris, France. But uh, Gimglish and Benjamin is going to tell us, of course, this more in detail. Um, but uh, they are operating in various different markets. Next, we have uh, Arnaud Portanelli and uh, Guillaume Le Dieu de Ville, um, the two co-founders of Lingueo. Lingueo is also a French startup. So, um, the two are based in Paris uh, as well. And uh, yeah, they are going to share some insights on how it is to set up a language learning startup, uh, or precisely, um, learning English in France. Then we have uh, Jason R. Levine, or I guess for some more famously known as uh, Fluency MC. And uh, what Fluency MC is all about and what his concept is, uh, well, Jace is just uh, going to share this in a minute with you. We have Mo Buckler. He is the creator of Trippin. Uh, Mo is or has traveled, I guess, most parts of the world, and that's being integrated in Trippin as a product. And uh, he is now based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And uh, yeah, I guess we hear or we will hear from him what. Brazilian learners expect from a product that wants to teach them English. Uh, then we have Prashant Rezada. He is the CEO of uh, English Up. He is based in London, but English Up is uh, specifically designed for the Brazilian market uh, as well. And uh, yeah, I'm already curious in hearing more what uh, a product or what does a product uh, need to deliver to be successful in the Brazilian market. And uh, last but not least, uh, my co-founder Schiff, uh, co-organizer, <laughs> co-organizer uh, Schiff, uh, who is going to, to moderate um, as well and uh, yeah, take on your questions and everything. Just uh, two quick uh, organizational things. Um, our Twitter hashtag is pound LLTCon. So if you want to ask one or uh, we are one founder in particular um, via Twitter. So you can tweet us at LLTCon. You can leave us a, a comment directly on YouTube. Or, of course, uh, we look at the um, Facebook stream and Facebook updates coming up. Uh, you can watch directly on the uh, LLTCon site as well or on the LLTCon page uh, on Facebook. And lastly, my name is Kirsten Winkler and I am the founder of EduQuest and we are an education media site. Okay. I guess that's enough for me, <laughs> as we really want to know about your experiences, um, guys, in the uh, ESL space. And if uh, Benjamin feels comfortable in starting this session, 
I would like to give it up to you and uh, hear what Gimlish is uh, all about and how you had the idea and um, also share some insights maybe if you had to adapt um, or modify the product for the different markets um, you are in and uh, yeah just tell us a little bit more and I'm very happy to have you as a speaker today. Okay, thank you Kirsten. So hi everybody, I am uh, Benjamin, I am co-founder of Jimlish.com. Uh, we are a nine years old company now based in Paris, uh, involved into English training online. Uh, how did we get the idea? Uh, actually, my partner Antoine my, uh, got the the, uh, the idea. Actually, what the, the, the initial idea of the idea because ideas start and then evolve. He was in Cost he was in Costa Rica or in Guatemala like ten years ago and had like this intensive Spanish course program and uh, like six hours of uh, private teacher course every day and uh, um, he realized he was uh, of course learning a lot of things but uh, on the same time forgetting a lot of things. So he designed a program uh, from the Cyber Cafe uh, close to his uh, place in Guatemala where he, he, he actually uh, entered the, the whole verbs and conjugation, Spanish verbs and conjugation data into some like map, to some database and then uh, did a little program that would ask him like send him some by email some QCM, some little quiz about um, the good conjugation in Spanish for this verb and this tense. Uh, and from there, what was interesting is that uh, since he was realizing he was forgetting a lot, uh, it, it started to personalize the program so that instead, to, instead of having a linear pedagogy, which means like go over the whole tenses and the whole verbs in Spanish, he started to, to ask his program to to ask questions in priority on weaknesses, on um, tenses or verbs where the program knew there was some weakness, there was some error in the past. And uh, from there, he like he studied like science, cognitive science, and uh, what is commonly known as space learning, space-based learning, to introduce like this like interval, uh, timing intervals after which you want to review something before forgetting it. And um, so from this little uh, experience from Guatemala and this text-based uh, program that would send emails with quiz, we decided to start Gimlish, uh, which was not for Spanish verbs but for uh, business English learning, and who would um, um, send daily emails um, very short emails that would uh, be very personalized that would, instead of like uh, going over the, the, the linear pedagogy for instance uh, uh, lessons 1 to 50 for beginners then uh, lessons 51 to 100 for intermediate levels etc that would like uh, naturally and dynamically pe personalize the content to, to, to push to the user according to everyone's needs, weaknesses level, and according to how those weaknesses evolve over the time, just as a normal natural teacher does. So this is briefly how about the origin of the idea. Uh, today, Jimlish uh, has more than one million users worldwide, mainly in Europe, um, mainly in France, of course, but as well in uh, French, German, and Spanish-speaking Europe. So Spain, and Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, etc. Uh, we address both companies and uh, individuals. Uh, we have uh, roughly uh, one half of our customers are corporate customers, the other half are, are individual customers. And um, we recently launched a baby brother product to, for French learners and the, the name of the product is Fantastic and uh, it is based on the same uh, same ingredients of technology and of content. What is important to maybe to remember about our product is that uh, uh, nine years ago we there were already many tools for what we call e-learning or distance learning or self-learning. There were nine years ago a lot of platforms, a lot of content online, a lot of multimedia materials. So we didn't start this company to provide uh, another one. 
but we realized uh, very quickly after we started working on the project that uh, in this like segment of self-learning and on distance learning, there was like a provision. There were a lot of tools, a lot of resources, a lot of technology, but very little rate of participation from all kinds of users, be it adults, kids, companies, schools, and uh, that's why we. That's what we really uh, decided to. That's the problem we decided to to solve. Um, all teachers have their charisma. They they come maybe at your company. They come at your home. They maybe you like them. Maybe they have. Charisma, but when you are in a context of self-learning in front of a screen, it's difficult to to remain um, uh, to remain motivated. So that's all the, the the choices we've made designing that product were aimed at reaching very good rates of participation. And today we have like a, an average 80% rate of participation of our users on the one-year window of training. So. Um, we have several keys for that, but that's if we have to remember one thing of our products, but that would be it. That it's not, we didn't come to add another platform, another, um, another place where to find uh, resources. Uh, we wanted to, to make people uh, improve their English, and um, to make people improve their English, we thought it would be good to try to get like little efforts, small efforts, but over time, regularly. And to stimulate those efforts, thanks to a format, email, a size, 10, 15 minutes per day, um, personalization to not get discouraged in front of difficulty or in front of something too easy, and by some humorous content that is our last touch, we scenarized and we wrote stories about old materials, old materials, and uh, we recorded uh, those segments with actors, and we tried to put a lot of like plot and. Uh, and a lot of interest in the stories we would tell so that we could keep motivation. So I don't know how much time I should talk about it. I could tell you many more things. <laughs> but uh, I think as an introduction, that was great. And uh, we see what comes up in the discussion. I'm sure Shiv has some questions. I definitely have some questions for you. And then uh, look at the streams, um, what our viewers would like to uh, ask about the product and, um, uh, and so on. So I would say thank you as a first uh, impression and sort of brief description of what Gimlish does. And um, just Mm -hmm. I will add that we recently opened an office in, uh, in Israel and in Brazil. So I, I hear there are many uh, actors, some actors around uh, that hang out uh, in Brazil. So we are starting there as well. Oh, uh -huh. But just starting as far as we are concerned. Okay, great. Um, yeah, let's continue with um, Prashant. As uh, you mentioned, the Brazil connection, maybe, and uh, yeah, English Up. As I said, uh, Prashant is the CEO of English Up, and uh, yeah, they are also. Uh, or the product is also targeted at the um, Brazilian market in particular. So, Prashant, um, a few or the brief description, um, maybe elevator pitch of uh, what English App does and uh, yeah, what are your experiences with the Brazilian learners so far? Yeah, sure, uh, Kirsten. First of all, uh, guys, apologies, uh, my camera's conged out. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just making an excuse because I like to hide. Uh, <laughs> So uh, <clears throat> yeah. So what what is English Up? Uh, uh, English Up is uh, is uh, you know this is really a, a majority owned venture of Macmillan Science and Education today, uh, and uh, uh, it is English Up is uh, is a personalized online uh, English learning school. That's the best way of putting it. Targeting consumers. Uh, I would say largely in emerging markets, and you know we are specifically targeting uh, adults who don't have the money and or the time to go to a, a, a traditional language school. So our competition is uh, we regard our competition as people who are either taking private tutoring lessons or are going to uh, going to uh, 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 offline language schools. And 
you know what is what is nice about English Up? First of all, to give you some background about the company, I mean this comp they, you know we are less than a year old. We were conceived uh, uh, around Jul June and July last year when I joined hands with uh, with Macmillan. And for those of you uh, who are not familiar with Macmillan here, uh, it is one of the it is the second largest producer of English language uh, learning materials uh, globally. And it's present in over 50 countries. So that was the that was you know partly the reason why I joined hands with them. Uh, it was not as if I was running an English language company. In fact, uh, I, I was uh, focused on a, on the employability skills side of online uh, education before that. But then, in, as we started working together, we realized that uh, English learning is one of the most important employability skills globally. And both of us uh, brought together a lot of things. Uh, you know, this marriage between what I would say me and my original team and Macmillan was, uh, you know, English language depth, understanding of emerging markets, uh, understanding of employability skills, and things like that. We all brought it together under English Up. And uh, as as Kirsten pointed out, we launched uh, only about four months ago in Brazil. So, uh, Benjamin, we are not very far ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, but in terms of us, uh, I guess a new venture, four months does feel like a long time. Right. Um, maybe to continue this um, idea of setting up a language school, but not the traditional brick and mortar way, rather online, is uh, something that um, Lingoeo has, I would say, evolved uh, into. And uh, well, Arnaud and Guillaume, uh, as I said, they are also based in, in Paris, France. So um, naturally, a lot of the learners and students um, are French and uh, want to improve on their English skills. Um, but uh, yeah, guys, maybe you are better or you can do it better than uh, I can in describing the Lingueo idea and how it started and what it has now evolved uh, into and what are the reactions of your French customers and learners. Yeah, hi everybody. So I'm Guillaume, this is Arno. Uh, Lingueo started like uh, five years ago. Uh, in fact, our main problem, because we are French, uh, was in English and uh, English speaking. So we were looking around, and to be honest, in France, we've got very, very bad level in English. So we met some survey, and we find out that uh, during seven years of, uh, of school, you can't speak more than two hours of English. Uh, when you know that English is uh, the global language, it's a bit of a shame. So we were coming back from the valley, Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, where we used to work in some technology, uh, uh, in a technology company specialized in e-learning. Uh, one of them was doing some software uh, targeting uh, the Japanese market, but every, everything was soft-based. And But we came back to France and we were working a lot with the company uh, based in Palo Alto and also in India, and we were using video conferencing, and that's where starts the idea of Lingo. Put together some uh, students with teacher all around the world, providing the best tool just to have the best class experience. And uh, first of all, we thought we could make the eBay of the the language eBay. So Kirsten and uh, uh, Kirsten uh, know that. We spent like two years and a half, almost three years working on this idea. Uh, it was very nice uh, with a lot of people, but uh, for the French market, in fact, providing a, a two, two free product, meaning uh, you can choose any teacher, uh, you are free to take just one lesson or two, uh, it was too much uh, I don't to choose too much choose. I mean, if you to, if you have too much to choose, you're not able to choose. I mean, uh, it was the problem. There were like around five thousand teachers on, of uh, on Lingua.com at this time, and uh, when a client came, uh, and the price were different. 
you can have a teacher for 10 euro um, per hour and you have another one 20 50 and uh, so after that we, uh, we we change our strategy and right now we're still doing some classes one-to-one -one classes only in English and uh, 15 different languages but um, we just with. have like we just have with the only only uh, uh, professional teachers um, that are chosen by us first and um, that we guarantee the quality the main the main um, word right now is quality if somebody's coming we're not uh, we're offering the guy he's not going to waste his time with us he's going to practice uh, his language a lot uh, overall he's going to speak and he's also in going to do some grammar but uh, it's all going to be a human uh, a human connection with the teacher and um, which is very yeah. motivating in fact Benjamin was talking about that one of our main concern was about motivation as well because even with a teacher when you have to move to a school to a place or when the teacher is coming the, the motivation is quite low in fact and uh, we, we tried and I hope we do and we will uh, uh, evolve again and improve but uh, we get an amazing uh, participation with uh, so you purchase for some classes and uh, everybody is per it's the average per staging is uh, three times ten hours so it's 30 hours per year which is for an average very 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 good so we are very happy of that okay yeah, that's it <laughs> okay that's it for the moment and um, I think that's a very good point and maybe um, uh, Jason would like to continue on this thought because Jason previously worked uh, let's say on a more traditional basis uh, if you will in a real language school in uh, New York City and is now shifting more and more um, of his activity and teaching um, online on various platforms and has also invented a um, concept he calls ColoLearn, so I guess uh, he is going to give you an introduction to what ColoLearn means, and um, and yeah, tell us a little bit about the differences. Or uh, what do students expect in a brick and mortar language school? And then you also traveled uh, just recently, traveled um, North Africa and the, the Middle East, and yeah, what what some of these developing countries, or if you want to call it emerging markets see in, in learning English and how important it is for them but I guess not necessarily have the, the money of course uh, people here in Europe or um, in Northern America uh, might have. Thank you for that great introduction. It's precisely what I'd love to talk about so thank you Kirsten and uh, Thanks, everybody. I'm glad to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Jason R. Levine. I also go by Fluency MC, and I use that name uh, because I've created and continuing to create uh, songs uh, based on hip hop music to teach uh, English as a second language, foreign language, uh, to train teachers in ELT. And actually, I also have songs to teach uh, content areas from social studies to science and uh, mathematics, test prep, and so on. And uh, as Kirsten said, uh, my background is, up until a couple years ago, was uh, doing uh, serving as an academic director for a couple different schools, developing curriculum at co for college ESL programs. And um, right now, I'm mainly focusing on uh, a position as ambassador and knowledge entertainer, you can tell I, I came up with that one, uh, for WizIQ, which is a really wonderful community of teachers and learners uh, where I'm uh, developing some courses that will be coming out and also launching a brand new show where I'm spotlighting uh, really dynamic, passionate English language teachers from around the world. And this week, Rachel from Rachel's English is going to be on. And uh, I have my eye on a uh, uh, Mo right here and some other teachers to bring on that show. So I guess the best way to explain uh, how I feel very briefly about brick and mortar versus online is when you've got, uh, and we just heard uh, uh, how important it is for a teacher to be there for motivation uh, for the students, I feel that the uh, virtual classroom is a very exciting uh, space 
uh, if you bring in all the really wonderful uh, tools and uh, media there that are so wonderful and really can't be used the same way in a brick and mortar classroom, yet you can have the kind of social engagement uh, that you can have uh, in a regular classroom somewhere like that. And I, and I see the future as uh, being more uh, those those virtual classrooms uh, being you know, more dynamic, easier to use, uh, places where people who already know each other uh, in social media can come together around content and around uh, groups of teachers and do all kinds of great stuff to learn English and, and other languages. And um, Kalo Learn. Um, I mentioned the songs that I make. I call them Kalo Tunes. Um, everything I do uh, basically is based on uh, the idea of collocation, you know, high-frequency chunks of language, word combinations uh, from the lexical approach. The idea is, uh, I think most of us uh, understand quite well how important uh, chunking language is uh, to uh, second language acquisition, first language acquisition for that matter. Uh, what I discovered was there really wasn't enough uh, exposure students were getting in the classroom, worksheets, et cetera, to collocations. And the magic of collocations really happens, uh, as you see in our first languages, when we have multiple exposures to these chunks. Uh, what's the problem? Old-fashioned drilling, you know, the audiolingual method uh, made it not meaningful enough, boring. So what I try to do with my songs is create things that teachers and learners are going to want to listen over to over and over again. I've also created games, uh, which I'm going to bring out in the near future. For now, I'm not trying to really market that stuff to... Uh, uh, directly so much as I'm trying to take my approach and use it uh, in the online classroom and to get as connected as I can to teachers and learners out there uh, through social media. Yeah, and you have definitely um, established yourself uh, as a personal brand uh, and I guess um, that sort of set, uh, it's a good level set um, for later entrepreneurial uh, activities. So somebody, um, I guess now uh, going the entrepreneurial path with his uh, first, I guess if I'm not mistaken, first own uh, product in the ESL space uh, is Mo. And uh, as I said, Mo is the creator of Trippin. And uh, tell us a little bit more about what Trippin is all about. Um, well, I've, uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Um, my, name is, my name is Mao. Uh, it's short for Mauricio because I'm Brazilian. I was born here in Brazil, but I've been teaching English uh, around the world for the past 20 years. Uh, half of that time has been in Brazil, and a lot of the rest has been in Australia and Thailand. Um, now, my experience with teaching Brazilians, I mean, every nationality is specific, you know, but uh, most of what I learned, I think, is what I learned teaching in Australia, uh, teaching people from all over the world. So in each classroom, um, you know, you had people from all over the world, and they all have their own, like I say, their, their own uh, general traits, their own stereotypes, which uh, you need to address uh, in order to get the message, get the learning across. Now, tripping... Um, yeah, Tripping was, uh, was a project that just started out because, I mean, I've, I've been working with alternative forms of teaching English. My name is Mao. I'm short for Mauricio because you not I'm hear Brazilian. Me? I was born here in Brazil. We hear you. If you have the YouTube English, open in the background, the world the you should get a close it. I don't. Time has not been me. In Brazil and a lot Somebody of else? Been in Australia and Thailand. Uh, could it be you, Jason? Uh, now, my experience with teaching Brazilians, I mean, every nationality. Well, at least I sound good. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, tripping is, is exactly that. It's taking English um, and presenting it in a, in a worldwide fashion. It's designed for everyone worldwide. Uh, therefore, um, in my experience of which parts of the language grammar acquisition are harder or the pronunciation harder for each nationality, um, that's what I address in the content that I've created in each specific place. So Tripping takes the idea of the, the particularities of each nationality uh, and 
uses that to um, not only address it, but also to make other nationalities or other people aware of this. Because if you take like, well, like I say, these, these are stereotypes, so I don't want to offend anyone, but for example, Spanish speakers normally will have, uh, it'll be harder for them to differentiate the V and the B sound. Uh, Asian students have a really hard time just expressing their own opinions and questioning teachers. Um, you know, if you, uh, the, the way Brazilians deal with, uh, with education is, is very specific in the sense that they have no respect whatsoever for teachers. They have no respect for authority. They have no, uh, they have no uh, idea of, I will learn this language correctly in order to uh, be able to speak fluently. They don't want that. They want to be able to communicate with other people worldwide. And I mean, that's very strong in Brazilians because, like I say, they don't, they're not a very formal people. We're not a very formal people, so we don't really stick to the rules. Therefore, I mean, there's a revolution going on right now in Brazil. I, I don't want to change the subject, but I mean, that's what <laughs> it shows what's uh, the way we, we, we deal with things here. Um, so tripping, to put it in a nutshell, uh, takes my best practices offline, teaching offline, and has translated them into what I believe works online, because I've been working with online education since 2004, and I've created not only, back in 2004 I created something called The Lounge, which was like a gym people went to just to study English. They showed up whenever they wanted to and did whatever they wanted to, as long as it was in English. But in order to maintain this, I needed to work with them off, off uh, work with them online as well. Tripping does the same thing. It presents information online. It uh, teaches. It tests. It reteaches. It retests in different formats. But most importantly of all, it wants you to take that information that you've gotten online, use it offline, and bring it back to the online world to show how you've actually managed not only to absorb it, not only to understand it, but actually produce it so that other people can, yeah, comment on it as well. So, yeah. To transition a little bit, uh, we had from Jason, technically he is not or has not set up a business yet. Um, how does Trippin work? Uh, is it a subscription-based uh, model like uh, Gimglish or um, what it, do you have in mind? It's, uh, well, I launch in a month and a half. When I, I mean launch, I mean officially because right now you can go to tripping.com and, and it's working and you can see it. We're still testing, of course, so there are glitches, but uh, it works. It works very well. You can get a good idea. Of, uh, of what we want to do there. Um, it's going to be subscription based once I launch and the idea is la the launch date is very important because once it launches it begins uh, the basis of go tripping which is the core part of the product it's a uh, it's like a treasure hunt around the world we begin in Australia and you have to watch videos in Australia understand answer questions interact in order to get enough points to unlock the next video so that you can complete the story and then unlock the next story and go from Australia to Indonesia to India to Nepal to Europe to Colombia to Brazil and all the 13 countries we currently have um, content for. So the idea is to launch a new story every week so it's kinda like web TV. You pay in order to actually, yeah, watch the shows but that's the core product now there is the rest of tripping which supports the core product which is open to anyone for the first 21 days after the first 21 days I mean you still see uh, the shows that we have on the lounge you still see the songs and the artists that we feature on tunes um, without paying those two are always going to be open but that's passive learning. There's nothing wrong with passive learning, but it's just a small part of the whole learning process. So we want you to watch it, we want you to have fun, we want you to share it with your friends, but most of all, we want you to join us around the world and yeah, watch, it, uh, watch the whole story because, like I say, it has a beginning, it has a middle, 
and I really haven't filmed the end yet. Okay. Can you, spell, you please tell the URL because we don't we're not able to find the website. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'll just type it in here. Yeah, in the uh, chat, it's the second on the um, from from go. the top. So I okay, would a... say to initiate um, the roundtable discussion, and I'm sure um, Schiff, as co-founder of Language Lab, has made. Um, his own experiences with um, both corporate um, as well as Asian students and then let's also talk a little bit about uh, business models and what you guys found out uh, works best um, for you. So um, as I mentioned I think Gimlish is uh, subscription based, uh, English up uh, as well uh, Lingueo, you buy lesson packages, is that right? Or maybe you have a subscription yeah. element as well. Um, and otherwise, I would give it to Shift to ask uh, maybe some more detailed questions. But but basically, let's just share what has worked well for you and what were some lessons you learned on on the way. Uh, yeah, just if I can kick this off, everybody, could each of you just pretty quickly, um, this may not apply right now, but could you name some one feature of your product, service, or business model that you think wouldn't work outside your key market? So this it's market, you've done it just specifically for your market. Did you hear that? No? Yeah, but he, he basically, he asked, what is the one feature you see in your setting or in your surrounding that would otherwise not work or maybe your unique selling proposition if I understood that correctly. Yeah, so if, if I say better now, one thing that in your product or service that would not work in another market. So if you took your service to China, you wouldn't do this one thing. Okay, that wouldn't work in another market. So what part of Lingueo works is particularly designed for the French market and wouldn't work, say, in uh, in England, or of Gimglish, or is it such a universal product you think you can replicate and bring to um, every other market? But for no, only the, the the customer service for no, because we can replicate re replicate it replicate it everywhere, I guess, especially in some country like Brazil, the US. UK, Spain, Germany, it's just a question of time. But because we want to provide the best quality and with best quality you've got the service, so the tool, the technology, you've got the teacher, and then also the support. The support is very important for us. And support is a team well organized and uh, and the only thing we could change for us is the marketing, not the service in itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, maybe Benjamin, uh, do yes. you think um, Gimglish, it's also mainly a marketing question uh, and we heard this in our keynote um, today, just, uh, just earlier this afternoon, that uh, marketing is becoming more and more important. Do you, so do you think for Gimglish success, um, in the respective markets, marketing is a main focus, or do you also have to uh, adjust the product? Say, let's say. No, we we, we have other issues. Uh, for instance, in Brazil, it's been uh, it's been a few months, so it's very early. But uh, um, our product, uh, Gimlish, addresses non-beginners. I would say post-beginners, elementary, intermediate levels to advanced levels which uh, pretty much correspond to the European average level. Uh, after a few months in Brazil, we realized that the average level is actually lower than, than France. Uh, no offense to the Brazilians, but uh, um, they are, the, the market has a lot, of, a lot more of beginners than demand. Um, so our product is not suited to beginners, so to speak. We have a second product that came later that could address their needs, but uh, 
So, um, so we really have a, we really have a, a constraint on the on the product level. So either we we say fair enough, we're gonna stick, we're gonna let the product as it is, and we're gonna address like the niche market of advanced levels. Um, or we could, uh, what we're doing now, integrate in Jimglish like some lower level material so that we can address beginners' needs. But it's very linked to the marketing as well because um, uh, the marketing, uh, you know, French, European people maybe they, they, when they say they are advanced lovers in English, uh, they are super advanced lovers in English. They, they are somehow lower than uh, their they are very complex and they think they are very bad, so they, they, they don't auto, um, how, do, how shall I put it, they, uh, they would say they are intermediary levels where they, some of them would be advanced level. We figured out in Brazil that we have to, to maybe, well, in, in, I'm going to be clearer, in, in Europe we say Jimlish is for intermediary levels. We may have to say in Brazil, like, we may have to say one day in Brazil that Jimlish is for advanced levels because the, the as soon as they, they, they have a bit of English, maybe they, they auto proclaim themselves at intermediary level. So it's just a difference. I, think, I don't think they are uh, more uh, French or more modest, humble. That's not my point at all. I, on the contrary, they, are, they have a different reputation on that front. Uh, but um, it's a question of vocabulary, so we have to adapt marketing. And we may have to say in Brazil that our product should be to advanced levels, where we say in Europe that it is addressed to intermediary level. Mm -hmm. So that's one big yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I think this coincides with some conversations I have had with uh, Prashant, who um, shared with me that currently, at least, uh, English app is also designed for the the fourth beginner, let's say a two level um, students, and and maybe. Do you also see a difference um, if, as you said, you have part corporate learners, you have part, I guess, what we would call the, the lifelong learners, uh, and maybe another part who want or need to improve on their English for their jobs, and Mao already shared some of the um, let me call it special features of the Brazilian learners. Um, so, uh, Prashant, tell us a little bit more about how uh, or for whom you set up uh, English up as a product. Yeah, so, uh, so Kirsten, we, um, you know, w w the, the, our vision behind English up is to go after a certain target segment globally. But uh, as uh, as Mao pointed out very nicely, we have to be very cognizant of uh, you know what local markets need. And I'm trying to answer several questions here. But uh, and Shiv then pointed out you know what are the things that would not work in other markets. Um, so in Brazil, wh when we looked very deeply at consumers, we realized some of the things that Benjamin has just mentioned, which is people tend to overstate their qualifications. But at the same time, most people are actually, uh, there are a lot of people who are at a beginner level. And we decided to target the beginner level people um, because our course is designed to, um, as a fairly comprehensive online course, which at the moment the product lasts one year. And you know, it gives us a chance to actually take them from where they are to a, to a substantially higher level if they engage properly. And, and these cousin consumers uh, that we are targeting are largely professionals. Uh, you know, they're not high-level professionals. They're lower-level professionals, um, you know, in, in junior-level jobs in, in various industries. So we found that this is the niche that we will target uh, or at least start with because they are motivated enough to learn. And, uh, and they will be, yeah, you know, they, will, they are at a beginner level and they will probably stick with us for a long time. And... And allow uh, you know both sides to become successful, you know, me, which means English up as well as them. I have uh, several questions coming up uh, in the Twitter streams and also via Facebook, and uh, I make this uh, open question so uh, whoever feels he has an answer or opinion um, to that um, can take the lead. 
And the first one is uh, from Akadi via Twitter, and um, he asks whether you consider learning English as acquiring information or a specialized skill. I guess that's um, somewhat heading to the, the job context. And then a um, somewhat related question from Sylvia via Facebook. And um, this is how to teach best. Is it reaching out to a group or massive online teaching? Or for your customers, uh, students, do you think a one-on-one -on -one approach works best? And uh, as I said, an open question. So whoever both. would like to answer. I think it's, I think it's both, actually. I think. Um, you need massive online learning is is doable and it should be uh, but it's a part of the learning you need especially with language learning um, it's or as Arcady asked is it a specialized skill is it a, is it language acquisition it's all of it you need to acquire the language you need to, but you need to understand the culture behind it and you need to take the language and the express that, that you're acquiring and make it familiar you need to make it something that's familiar to you and therefore, you need assistance in that. So you need a, you, you do need a teacher. You, you, you need a guide. You need someone who will help you make, uh, make sense of the, the, the words that you're learning, the grammar that you're learning, in order to build constructions that are very personal to you, so that you're not thinking in your language and then trying to translate and then trying to express yourself. You're simply um, evoking sounds that are automatic to you because of the specific situation that you've already internalized, if that's not too complicated. In so fact, create your learning portfolio of different things um, that might uh, appeal to you, not necessarily coming from one source offering every... Yeah, you need, um, you need personalized learning connected with massive learning. You need the information to be presented to everyone, but you also need people to, uh, to make it personal. All right. Somebody w would like to follow up on this or um, share his uh, own thoughts? Yep. Do, uh, I absolutely agree with him. Um, and we are just doing one part of it. It's uh, just the part, the assistant, the guy, um, which is, in, in our case, a teacher um, but, um, who has diploma. Uh, diplomas. Um, his Diploma job school. is pretty much to teach, and uh, this is what we do. We're, we're just helping the people uh, to learn one to one. Our clients comes to us for this. Doesn't mean that um, there is not plenty of other way to learn, and, uh, and for someone it's going to work. Uh, watching movies or um, or reading some emails or uh, whatever, and you can mix. Sometimes some of our clients are mixing uh, services that are here in the team. I'm, I'm talking about Jinglish. We have clients that have um, are Jinglish clients, and they're also Linguales uh, users. Um, but when you come to us, it's just because you want to practice with uh, with a teacher. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, can, I, can I jump in a sec? I just, I just uh, wanted to just say something quickly, if that's okay. Um, I totally agree with, with you guys, and I wanted to offer just a different perspective um, a little bit, which is uh, what what I found has worked, um, I and mean, I'm in a very different situation than, than, than you folks, um, is connecting with uh, second language speaking English teachers in their home countries who are bringing all this great content from everywhere on the web uh, as much as they can into their classrooms. Of course, there are restrictions they, they face in terms of the curriculum they have to follow and the, the ministries of education and so forth. But um, there has there is now more opportunity for these teachers to bring materials uh, like my videos and countless other uh, people's materials into the classroom. And I think what's so exciting about that is you get that teacher uh you know, attention, that live classroom, and that teacher who knows you, knows your, your culture, your language, and is an uh, English learner himself or herself, but at a much higher level. And there's a really wonderful scaffolding phenomenon that takes place there where I'm, uh, I'm just using myself as an example, uh, but it could be any content like my own uh, or Rachel's English, for example, uh, that the teacher is learning 
from us in a way and also bringing that content to their students and it can be very dynamic of course it's 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 really the same thing as putting on a conversation cd you know how many years ago where it's not the teachers input anymore but the teachers there to facilitate and uh, i think that's it's really exciting to think about, uh, in the future uh, how far that can go before I ask Schiff for um, his or um, questions popping up in the stream um, concerning pedagogy, even uh, if your businesses uh, are online, do your students expect uh, that you use traditional methods or are they ready or even actively asking for more modern, more innovative um, approaches what have you um, gotten as, as as feedback let's say uh, let me take that one uh, is that who Kirsten can I uh, just so that I'm not confused about is this question directed towards Shiv or is it an open question to the forum it's an open question to 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 everybody but as you all have um, online uh, ESL or, or English as second language um, uh, products yeah. and uh, I guess um, students who still learned English the traditional way in uh, school but uh, have now actively decided to continue studying and learning it online um, and do they um, still expect traditional patterns or um, do they actively want to have something non-traditional and more modern? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, we did a lot of work in this area, Kirsten, because this was our biggest, uh, it, it was actually personally my biggest question mark. Uh, and if you like, Mac having the Macmillan pedigree was to some extent forcing us to go more traditional than we wanted. Uh, but on the other hand, we, we had consumers who were actually trying to be a little bit too funky with what they wanted. So, you know, uh, what we learned was, uh, and I think Mao put it very nicely, that you have to try and bring the best of both, of best of both worlds together. Uh, we realized that at least for the kind of segment we are targeting, it is very important to have a certain structure or a clear pedagogy. Uh, and uh, so, for example, you know, if you leave learners with lots of tools online, they, they like it, but then they get confused. And then after the initial enthusiasm, the reality of learning a language starts to come into play and then they leave. So at that point, structure comes into being. A real teacher, which we have in our offering, comes into play and makes, makes life a lot, lot easier. And interesting videos come into play and make the learning a little bit more interesting. But these things have to be packaged in an intelligent way um, for the learner to ultimately achieve his or her objective. Perfect. Um, thank you for um, yeah giving us some insight in how um, English Up as a product uh, or what you had uh, to respect in creating English Up as a product. Um, anybody thing. else? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just one thing. Uh, I, I do agree 100% with that. But um, also it's funny because we've got a lot of K-12 students uh, for tutoring uh, uh, each week. It's very regular. But the parents, in fact, are the clients and the learner are the kids. And all the parents, most of the parents, are coming and want something very, very different from school. Just the point I wanted to underline, if they are looking for the really cultural experience, the how to get confidence. They are not looking only for the pedagogy. They are looking for the confidence, which is very missing. I'm talking about the French market. I don't know elsewhere right now. But uh, we've, we've got a big problem on that. Mm. Maybe, maybe I, I, I will add something. I mean, because you were, uh, this question from a user on Facebook or Twitter said, like, should we, should we choose one-to-one -one or collective group? Should we shoot online methods or traditional actors? Uh, below all these questions, I think we should put back the user's very own interest and taste and... Uh, um, at the first criteria, you know, when I talk to to our corporate customers, like we talk to HR managers, training managers, 
and they say some of them say, "Oh, I know, I know what is good for these guys. Uh, the the finance guys there, I'm going to give them a group course. Uh, the like the managers over there, I'm going to give them a one-to-one -one course. Uh, and these guys that are already, always on the road, I'm going to give them e-learning." And they assume they know what is good for all of them, which I think is a mistake. Because in the end, uh, we have like a, among our users within companies, we have like big shot CEOs or traders that their HR department assume they would never do our English learning, distance learning thing because it would be too cheap or whatever. And finally, they happen to be with the biggest interest rates. And, uh, and, and we have uh, all examples and counter examples. So we should like, uh, I mean, uh, it depends on we are very, very own uh, interest, taste, and we should always put the initiative at first, all the psychologists will tell you efficient learning is a uh, learning where the user is at the initiative. He took the initiative, he likes it, and maybe he likes group course, maybe he likes one-to-one uh, -one course, maybe he likes online learning. I mean, uh, in French, literally, we said that all tastes are in nature. Maybe there's the same proverb. So we yeah. should re a bit respect more that, and uh, in the in this ESL world, and uh, because of the big money put in advertising, uh, the messages are different and the consumer get, get very, very uh, confused because they hear, oh, virtual class is the best, oh, one-to-one -one is the best, oh, this one is the best, this other one is the best. And we have, the, we have this chance to have a wide variety of tools, methods, and the user should, should try out and, and choose because there is no, no one meta better than the other. Can I, can I just add one, one tiny thing? Uh, I, just, I, I don't think there are two things more important than what have just been mentioned here. Uh, confidence and uh, learners' interests and getting to directly what, what they need. And they're both inextricably linked. And uh, often what happens in a classroom, especially in a more traditional classroom in, in another country, uh, in my experience that I've seen, is uh, big problems with both of those because you've got a curriculum being followed that may be sort of old-fashioned or, or uh, constricted in some way and, and really not connecting with the students and then the stress or boredom or both that leads to the lack of confidence and, and not enough input in practice and um, take two examples Brazil and France just because I've got these people here that are focusing on those countries uh, I'm gonna be in France a lot next year in Paris uh, I have a big following there on YouTube and the students and teachers in France that comment they always say the same thing which is you know from having fun with this and and, and you know doing this at home or with my friends I can feel much you know more confident to speak English and then they're going to class and doing it, uh, or they're just using it, you know, uh, to get ahead in whatever ways in school or in their professions. You know, that's such a big deal. And you know, wonderful teachers are out there who take, you know, the time and the care to try to make that happen in the classrooms in, in uh, countries. But it's it's tough, and I think it's great that um, people like us and so many others are out there uh, trying to work on getting more at what students really want uh, and uh, what what makes them more confident and motivated. So I guess we have to, um, well, very soon uh, let our panelists go, but uh, Shiv, tell me, um, what have we learned? So um, English teaching and learning around the world all the same? Apparently not. Of course, we have talked a lot about um, the, the French market and the Brazilian markets respectively, but um, do you have some takeaways or maybe some some closing statements or comments um, on the social media side of things? Anybody? Or Shiv? No, I wanted to hear from you. Give me what you think, the critics had a audio break at the worst possible time. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're you're breaking up uh, a little bit there. So so no problem. But <laughs> so anybody else um, who would uh, who would like uh, to comment this? So um, as I said, apparently um, we have to respect um, the the different cultures and of course um, the educational system in the um, different countries where you um, established your, your service even though um, it, it might be entirely or partly um, online. But um, do we have unifying factors um, as well? What do, you, what do you guys think? 
Mm, it's like they said, the confidence. I think uh, uh, what you guys said, everybody said, you know, uh, it's not about learning English and speaking English. or It's about the confidence that is needed to do it. It's about the confidence that it provides once you actually do it. I think that's a unifying thread in it all. Okay. Benjamin had a statement as well. Yeah, we, since we are writing stories about all our materials and since we try to make those fun is humoristic, uh, so we have Eng native English speaking writers and they tend to use like the cultural uh, humor they get from the United States or England and uh, and uh, which is widely uh, accessible from uh, American English American culture but still we still have like once in a while uh, like nasty comments from like uh, for instance Muslim countries or even France or even Germany from elsewhere from people who don't like that kind of humor and uh, so sometimes we if we do a sex reference now we're into French teaching, and uh, in French teaching we try to teach French culture, and we go through Victor Hugo to teach French culture, and Victor, Victor Hugo happened to have like a very, very full, uh, I will say, sexual life. So we don't avoid that topics. We don't like, uh, don't we don't go into a pornographic content, but we still we don't avoid those topics, and we receive comments from once in a while people that are shocked because of their religion, because of uh, their age, because of their sensitivity, whatever it is. But we, we try not to censure too much our content because if we try to unify that, that humor, or the, uh, we, will, uh, we may lose 90% of our users' interest we, we, who like our humor. So we tell to those problems, oh, we don't pretend we're going to be nice to everybody. We're sorry, we didn't mean to offend you, we're sorry, but maybe Jim English is not the right product for you. Uh, because um, so we yes we have problems but uh, they are not too often uh, and we have a lot of customers in Germany in the Muslim countries in all the countries I and including old people young people we have a, a wide variety uh, but uh, when when we have like uh, people asking us to to censor to give some to take some sex reference out because somebody yelled. We usually don't take it out because many other people liked it, and we stimulate. Maybe we stimulate their motivation and their rate of participation thanks to that humor. And many of our competitors, they have like like lean, flat content platform, not so not not funny, uh, not offending anyone. But then they they have rates of participation that decline because it's boring. Very nice. Um, yes. Okay. I, I would. Uh, invite everybody uh, interested and in, uh, watching this live, of course, to check out um, the different products uh, Gimlish, Lingueo, Fluency MC on YouTube, and of course, very active on Facebook, uh, Trippin, um, and then English Up. And um, yeah, if you would take two minutes of your time and uh, we tweet out um, our survey about how you liked um, the session and if it was uh, informative and um, yeah, your general opinion. So it just takes two minutes, but it's very important um, for us to uh, yeah, deliver engaging discussions and uh, good content and um, of course your opinion is uh, very important to us in that respect as well. Um, otherwise I would yeah then soon close this session and uh, don't forget we have a second day with um, some root talks coming up and uh, another panel focused on community and peer learning. Um, Again, our hashtag is uh, pound LLTCon, otherwise all necessary information on uh, Facebook and we put the recordings up uh, on YouTube and share with you um, on Facebook and via Twitter. So thank you all for um, watching this, of course. Um, thank our participants very much in sharing um, not only about their products, but also some insights of uh, what you have to pay attention to and to, to respect uh, in the different markets they are uh, working in. And um, yeah, it was a very good um, and insightful learning experience for me. And um, well, thank you all for being so open 
and uh, and sharing with the other founders and uh, of course our viewers. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.